Hello and welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining our workshop on demonetization as an applied strategy for degrowth. Uh, in our 90 minute session, we want to give you an understanding of the logic of money and its implication on our daily life and relationships. In the second part, we will introduce our approaches to alternative ways of life. The last 30 minutes we want to use for small group discussions in different thematic fields and as a conclusive plenary session. We are thankful to present our ideas within the International Degrowth Conference, which brings together a vast range of different fields on degrowth strategies like the ÖPV Via Campesina, the Theater of the Oppressed, or the Global Eco Village Network, just to name a few. Let me shortly introduce our today's lecturers and our workshops agenda. To begin with, uh, Maria Cravania, who is actually already here, will show that, degrowth, that the degrowth we need is not possible with money. And she will connect this claim with our personal experiences as well as with the research of our dear friend, Dr. Eske Bockelmann. We will learn about what money is and what it forces us to do. Maria is in her first bachelor semester of applied cultural sciences at Alpe Adria University in Klangfurt. She has been individually trying out alternative ways of life basically since she entered our school system as a six-year-old. And last year, for example, she planned and carried out a low-budget tiny house project, which turned in her comfy tiny home shortly after. To continue, uh, Gerald Dobernick will unveil the functions and dysfunctions of money from an economic viewpoint and illustrate how money affects our relationships with other people as well as with nature. We will learn about concepts of organizing communities in a different way. Gerald is often referred to as our spokesperson on the state level of Carinthia, and he is also a great coordinator and project manager who always keeps an eye on our capacities. But he's an even better father who is fighting for a livable future for his daughter. He has studied business and economics here at uh, VU Vienna. After these 40 minutes of theoretical input, we will feature a stunning four minutes video clip about our movement, which was made with love and under COVID conditions, especially for the degrowth conference. This video intends to give you an overview about the wide range of our movements, activities, and introduce our money-free approach in practice. Finally, Vanessa Reiner will demonstrate our internal and organizational structure and share her personal experiences from projects like growing food, living a gift culture, and other attempts to overcome the destructive structures of our money-oriented system. Vanessa is part of the movement from the beginning and brings happiness and sparkles with her wherever she goes. She's a biologist and was working as a teacher in high school before she decided to spend all of her time on the urgently needed transformation of our society. After these three inputs, we want to provide space for you to dig deeper into any direction we can offer. We will set up six breakout rooms with different topics for you to join freely depending on your personal interests. These rooms should provide a small group settings for conversations in an informal atmosphere. Uh, the last 10 minutes we want to spend in a plenary setting to sum up our findings from the different groups and answer difficult questions as a group. As you may be found in our workshop description, all of us are part of Verantwortung Erde, uh, Responsibility Earth is literal translation. Uh, we are a movement in southern Austria, uh, which takes action on local social as well as political levels. Throughout our practical search for a life without exploitation and destruction, we collected experiences through money-free cycles. We will introduce our activities and projects later on. But first, we will have a closer look on the destructive dynamics of what Ulrich Brandt and Markus Wissen call the imperial way of life. Uh, we will look at it uh, through the factor of money. Since we recorded our video beforehand, we decided on collecting uprising questions through the chat function of Big Blue Button. So please make a use of it during the video. 
We will come back to the questions later in the breakout rooms. Please keep in mind that this session uh, will be recorded as well. And so also your questions will be visible for everyone who watches the video afterwards. You can always use also, uh, also use the Discord channel for your comments and questions. So, but now enough of my preliminary words. I proudly hand over to Maria, who will introduce you to the logic of money and I wish you a great workshop. Thank you so much for this wholesome introduction. So I would say, let's dive right into it. Why the degrowth we need is not possible with money. If one thinks about growth, one might see a plant in front of the inner eye, which is growing bigger and bigger as the time goes by. Or maybe a child slowly turning into an adult this is growth, natural growth. And despite the term, it has nothing to do with what we understand as economic growth. Today, I'm allowed to present you our understanding of growth, degrowth, and money. Various times and in various contexts, we asked people to write down in key points how they would like the world to look like. Here are the results. And not so surprisingly, most of them wrote something like peace, equality, respectful and mindful use of resources, fair resource distribution, education for everybody, freedom. Assuming that each and everybody longs for the same, namely a peaceful world, how come we're so far away from achieving these goals? How come we experience one crisis after the other? Whether it's related to climate change, our financial and economic systems collapsing, or people starving to death. People are suffering while the resources they are desperately seeking for are already existing. The spontaneous and impulsive answer many people give is that people are simply too egoistic and too narcissistic to make the world a better place. And even though there might be people who are greedy and selfish, it can't be everybody. Otherwise, we would not have gotten the answers we did. Indeed, it is quite unrealistic to assume our planet would be in its current condition just because some people are too selfish. Additionally, this thought makes us bitter and hinders us from acting. Luckily, there are numerous initiatives and organizations which try to make the world a better place. Close to all of those which were locally accessible were tried out by some of us. Repeatedly, limits were faced, which were not possible to be pushed by our willpower. Usually, the limits were strongly intertwined with money, but things started to change as we initiated the Erde and with it, more and more projects which worked without money. We call these attempts money-free cycles. Not knowing how things will turn out or even having an idea how enormous the effects of these trials would be, we preceded our projects. What happened was that things started to change. My friend Gerald will explain the effects of money later, even more detailed. Shortly put, not only that we could prevent virtually all kinds of social exclusion, but we also gained more and more trust. Furthermore, the constant feeling of lacking something, some kind of resource, was slowly but surely disappearing. You see, the things we need are already here. Money doesn't make anything. Money doesn't create anything, nor does it let resources grow. Goods must be made by humans, and if those humans make things, and we need those things, then why not seeing them and having a chat? Giving, sharing, and borrowing were way easier and way more effective than constantly chasing money. But before, we had never thought about those options. And I'm not even going to start elaborating how free we felt by the decisions we made and which great network we created through working on human relationships and not on business contacts. It was not till years in the project that we realized how disconnected we humans are from each other and how detached from our surroundings most of us felt before. 
our group dynamics became better, merely because we were including everybody, trusting each other, feeling sure we had or would get everything we could possibly need, and feeling free to express ourselves. Those were unbelievably delightful consequences of such a small change, notwithstanding that we had still no clue why all of this happened. Certainly, we started to become more relaxed and at the same time more productive, but we did not bother to know why. And honestly, one doesn't need to know right from the start. Yet, if one never understands why, old patterns will slowly but surely slip back in. You see, it's more than a personal pattern, it is a compulsion which forces us to do things. We maybe don't even like those. People aren't bad. Trust us, we tried it out. People are just reacting to the world and systems they live in. Luckily, Dr. Eske Bockmann, who is a friend and part of our movement, found out. His recently published book, Das Geld, was es ist, das uns beherrscht, observes exactly these questions. And I will present some of his findings in the following. Before, I would like to highlight again that even without understanding the full concept of money, one can make a difference in simply starting to become active. Not everybody needs to understand in its full consequences what I'm going to explain. This is also the reason why we're now publishing a book on doing the difference, not just understanding the problem. Mm -hmm. So whoever is interested into learning about money-free cycles and how, how life is like in our projects will be able to read about it in our upcoming book. So, what is money? We are all aware that money is a medium of exchange. But it is important to highlight that it's purely a medium of exchange. What that means is what we are going to observe now. This pure medium of exchange contrasts the material medium of exchange. In order to understand what the difference is, we're going to look at the key characteristics of both. A material medium of exchange can be close to everything. They can be seashells, coins, fabric, salt, grain, or gold. As the name already indicates, the important part is that there is some kind of goods. Them being goods makes the existence independent from being or not being exchanged. Trading salt against grain does neither define the salt nor the grain. They simply do not need any validation in being the goods they are. If they once get exchanged and after that trade they get never traded again, they're still used as the material they are. And this was the way of trading for a long historical period, which ended somewhere in the medieval times in Western Europe. Even though coins had already been used for trading, they were still defined by their material. Therefore, gold coins were, when not in use as coins, typically made into something else, like jewelry or other goods. Gold can be traded, but it doesn't have to. Grain can be traded, but it doesn't have to. What comes along with the realization that material goods do not need to be traded is the fact that they also don't need to grow in the sense of becoming more. There is no need for them to become more of whatever they are. The gain I make if I exchange my grain with your, let's say, salt, is the salt itself. I do not have to subtract my grain from your salt to know what my gain is. I gain the salt you give me. Now, let us look at the pure medium of exchange, aka money, or to be more specific, money as we know and think of it today. Money as a pure medium of exchange is neither good nor a commodity or anything real whatsoever. It is a figure, a number, and therefore nothing. Indeed, we see that money has real consequences, but not because money is something we could do anything else with or other than buy something for it. Consequently, 
money defines itself and becomes something through its function to be exchanged for real goods and only in this function. After all, the money we hold as paper or coins in our hands is solely attesting us owning money, which could just as well lay at our bank account. And we all know nothing actually lays on a bank account. It's just numbers being recorded. But why does this matter? Why do we have to look that closely into the essence of mediums of exchange? The answer is because we were all born in a world where our existence is threatened without this medium of exchange. Sooner or later, all of us need to make money in order to survive, right? Some of us are born rich, some of us are born poor, and although this is far from fair, this is not what we're going to look at right now. We want to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. The overall view shows that we all need money in order to get to the things we want and need. And this is going to be the target of observation in our next thought. What money forces us to do. As a matter of fact, the only way we can get most of the necessities which we need to live is to buy them. That is the first thing money forces us to do. But only in a society in which supply is based on buying and selling goods. Through special historical shifts, which happened primarily in Western European countries, an entire society was no longer supplied by the feudal system. Therefore, they had to live from what they were selling and buying. In order to sell something, one usually must already invest money. Allow me to illustrate this with a simple example. If I'm a company selling furniture, I must either buy chairs and tables to proceed selling them, or buy wood and tools in order to produce them myself. Either way, since we're living in a society where everything costs money, I must first spend money to get to sell something. Logically, I must sell the furniture now for more money than I invested. For most of you, this thought will not be new. Understanding this simple concept is crucial for most of us in order to survive. Yet many of us fail to see how this mechanism is forcing us to constantly make more money. This is the second compulsion of money. It constantly needs to become more of itself. For money to work the way it does and to also display its compulsions, the following three terms or conditions must be given. Firstly, we are born in a world where money is the primary option to get to everything you need to live. Further, it needs to be legally binding as in an institutionalized sense which means that it will be very difficult to sustain yourself without money, and in many life situations, even impossible. Therefore, money works like a barrier between a person who needs something and the thing they need. You want bread? You can buy it. In order to buy it, you need money. Okay, but if we want to do it without money, we need to make the bread ourselves. For that, we will need flour which we again need to buy. If we do not want to buy this neither, we need a piece of land to grow the corn, but that does cost money as well. We see just eating a slice of bread becomes close to impossible if you try to do it without money. Secondly, you can just get this so badly needed money if you sell something. I have already explained how one must first buy certain things in order to resell them. One can do this as explained with our furniture company by reselling tables or producing them theirself. Maybe you now want to argue that if you work as a waiter or waitress, you do not buy something before you sell it, since you're just selling your working hours. Well, in order to understand this, and here it becomes a bit more complex, we need to take money's point of view into perspective. Surely, for me, as let's say a waitress, I do not have to receive more money each month. Maybe because of tipping, my monthly income will vary, but overall, it does not need to become more every month. But let us follow the money we earn. The money we earn is part of a calculation our boss must make, in which our boss needs to do the exact same calculation as the furniture company, 
namely buying ingredients for food and drinks, paying electricity and rent, etc. And at the end of the day, getting more money from the customers, so money is left with which our boss and I, the employee, can live as well. But our money does not disappear after this. When I find it in my bank account, I will spend it, for example, on groceries. The supermarket selling them must do the exact same thing as the furniture company and the restaurant and everybody else. They must buy groceries first to sell them for a higher price later. For them to pay the employees and the bosses, you see, every time we spend our money, it might disappear for us, but the money itself does not disappear. It must fulfill the same trick, namely becoming more of itself. If money at the end of the day does not become more in somebody's wallet, the usual results are loss, bankruptcy, and in the worst cases, misery and hunger. And this brings us to our third point. Money might not disappear after we spend it. The things we consume surely do disappear as the goods they are. Not all of them, of course, but for example, groceries. Once consumed are gone as the resource with its specific purpose as groceries. Therefore, a rising supply on goods is needed for money to be spent again. And since everybody must act like our furniture company and make more money, and this more of money doesn't disappear, but is spent again, while goods are again disappearing, we need to make even more goods. We see this is getting out of hand quite quickly and seems to be growing exponentially. The more I earn, the more I spend. The more somebody produces goods, the more money whoever produced it gets. The more is spent again. The more, the more, the more, the more, the more. And this is what's happening on our planet every second, day in, day out. As mentioned previously, this stands in harsh contrast to material mediums of exchange, which do not need to become more in order to fulfill their purpose. Growth, as implied in degrowth, does not mean the natural growth of a plant. If a family eats 200 kilos of potatoes a year, there is no need for them to grow 400 kilograms of potatoes the next year. As we expose this need for money to constantly become more of itself, I would like to highlight that this mechanism works every time we spend money, no matter on what. There is no way to make money behave differently. You can't make it good or bad. There is no connotation to it. You can imagine it like a calculation or equation, which simply works the way it is written down no matter if the consequences are destroying our planet or not. No matter if it is forcing human beings to starve. No matter the most horrific outcomes one can possibly imagine. Money must grow. And since itself has no substance, it needs to clasp on goods in order to become more. If you want to make more money, you cannot simply make it yourself. You must sell something for it. All of a sudden, we need to produce 400 kilograms of potatoes just because we need to gain money out of the potatoes. And so money has to clasp and more and more of this beautiful world in order to sustain itself. Notwithstanding the damage it does to everything alive on this world. In order to analyze the compulsion money forces onto this world in detail, one must also investigate some other phenomena which are connected to it, like the specific competition for money, the form of property that excludes everyone else, a state which watches over all of this and keeps it going through a monopoly on the use of force, stuff like that. While all of this is important and worth its own talks, it is enough to understand money's compulsion on the individual's life to know that the compulsion are indeed real. Conceding that money is the compulsion which forces us to grow and in consequence destroys our world as well as causes harm to the people and beings on it, one must come to the conclusion that we need to disestablish money in the interest of degrowth, our planet and its inhabitants. So now what? 
This actuality, although first sounding quite overwhelming, can be understood in a positive and productive way. Our situation is not hopeless. There are enough people willing to spend a lot of time and effort into making a difference. What we must provide is a system in which the effort is not in vain. We ourselves are just tiptoeing and doing some baby steps into this direction, hoping to inspire others to create a better world together. Okay, thank you, Maria, for showing us the working mechanisms of money and how it affects our everyday life. Now, Gerald will dive even deeper into the topic and analyze our experiences through an economic viewpoint. So, I'm going to talk now about uh, the characteristics of money and what we call the dysfunctions of money and try to put it together from an economic point of view. Um, starting with money as a means of trade. This basically means that uh, if you have money, you can go to a shop and buy any goods or services um, you want to and leave without any social or moral obligations left. The second function is the storing of value, uh, which basically enables you to earn money today, for example, in Vienna, and spend it in Paris or Milan today, tomorrow, in 10 or in 15 years. So you have a storing in time and in space. And the measuring of value function enables us to think we could have an objective way of measuring how goods are in comparison to each other valued basically means that a house is probably worth more than a piece of cake. Uh, moving on. Now we come to the part of money we, I think we all do know exists, but we try to avoid connecting it with money. Uh, the means of money as a means of trade, as indicated earlier, uh, directly leads to the unchallenged logic of trading which means we could go buy or sell any product we would like and leave without caring of uh, the people or the shop owner, how they are, what the, uh, our consumption means to the way things are produced, in which conditions they are produced. And therefore it plays an essential role in this consumerism we see today. Because after all, you earned your money probably in a very hard way, and therefore you have the freedom to buy whatever you want. Uh, you are not responsible for anything beyond, and therefore you might even be helping in the way economic teaching shows it to us, people in a low wage sector by giving them money <laughs> or giving them a, a little a fee. Uh, let's move on to the storing part. Uh, isn't that a good thing that we can store value and move it to other places in the earth, maybe help them develop by giving them money? Well, we don't think so. We think that the storing of value is directly connected to the exploitation of uh, people and nature. And just to give you a brief example, just think about one moment if there was a company or a person planning to burn down parts of the rainforest in order to, let's say, plant palm there for making palm oil. oil. Uh, how would this scenario ever be thinkable without money? After all, we know after it is burnt down, the biodiversity will be gone for good. After the company, company leaves, after 15 years or something, the soil um, will be eroded probably for decades. So the people living there are left uh, without soil, therefore the ability to um, grow food for themselves. They are left without um, the biodiversity there. And still we see local, national and international authorities eagerly wanting to invest in such cases and in such areas. So, one question, if the people 
living there, the local people, would be reliant on the soil and not reliant on money in order to survive. What do you think they would say to such projects? Personally, I think you wouldn't be in favor of that. But even more so, and this is an important point, uh, what do you think if there wasn't money in place and especially the possibility to earn it there and spend it somewhere else in the world, um, what companies would really uh, engage in such projects? Because after all, it is... Um, this mentality that if anything is burned down at some place, it's not our business anymore, which is directly connected to the storing of value. And after all, it is very important to understand that our modern sense of neo-colonialism is directly linked to this behavior. So that way, let's move on to the disparity of real and debt-based finan uh, debt financial system. Uh, we all know that, um, how to say, that our financial system got detached from the, what we call real economy quite a long time ago. It's a uh, common sense, but we even more see on a, I think more problematic scale that our real economy <laughs> already got det detached from our ecolog ecological system. So we take out more resources than we, um, and we can retain in an ecological way. And the problem there being, we do not produce for the demand of people, we produce as much as money there is. And as there is way more money than we have resources on this planet, it happens the way we see it happening right now, that we are literally consuming our planet, which is at least problematic, but more on this later. And as indicated, the production always exceeds needs. Uh, there is, I don't know, I can't imagine hardly any company really producing the number of, uh, of goods really in demand. What we always see is that um, also related to fixed costs, uh, production is usually as much as it is affordable and it's pushed out and out. And what we see is that alone in Austria, we are throwing away 40% of our food production. Uh, or we have examples in the US where after the Volkswagen scandal, there are huge parking lots of new cars just standing there. They are not being sold. It's a huge waste of resources. And because money is um, also excluding people, we will leave them in the parking lot as long as nobody is able to buy them or is willing to buy them. So move on to another view on the dysfunctions of money. So now I've been talking about what's happened globally, um, how it all intertwines with our economic system. Now I want to have a closer look on how it uh, relates to our personal life and what it means to our everyday life. And I think this is a very uh, important viewpoint. I was shocked when I realized it for the first time myself. And I want to apologize for everything that might be seen now, which has been conveniently unseen earlier. So about personal relationships. Uh, it's what I experienced at some points in my life, but also I think what uh, we see on the whole planet, that people are often reporting to feel disconnected or the feeling of being alone in the world. And we think it is a part of development how money is penetrating every part of our life. And it's money and the combined logic of trade. Um, one example, if you go and buy uh, stuff at the grocery store, you don't really care how the shop assistant feels, how, if they have personal problems or anything like that. The same goes for virtually any shop or any business all over the world, because we learned and we have uh, deeply <laughs> understood in our system that once we pay the amount um, demanded, we are finished with this business. It is not ours to care anymore. And, this is um, a, a very, this is one central part why we can 
go on and uh, be be disconnected in some way, which is uh, even moving on into a very very private social lives where we start uh, trading hours, time for money, and such things. The concealment of structural violence is um, what I think the most important part here. It uh, it's it's capable of unveiling the real violence within our system. Um, do you think like you live in a, in a free place and in a, in a fair place, not just on a global scale, like we all know that there are poor regions in the world, but do you think in the place you live that it's, it's running quite fair and everybody has the same chances and such things? Um, well, I don't, and here's why. Uh, I got confronted with some questions like, um, do you think that the waiter working a 12 hour shift on minimum wage brings you the coffee because he likes bringing you coffee or because he just likes you so much? And what about the guy packing um, burgers at the fast food store? Do you think he's working his 12 hour shift on minimum wage because he likes uh, smelling like white stuff? or because he likes um, providing probably harmful food to people and also targeting to children like some burger chains do. Uh, well, I, pro I personally don't think so. And I think it goes for many, many, many jobs that we do on our planet that number one, we having the best time of our lives being used for doing this job. This means between 15 and 64, we spend a lot of time at the best time of the day, like when the sun is shining outside from eight to four or to five, uh, doing these jobs. And usually we're doing it with jobs that do not really relate to ourselves. So yeah, one could say that um, those people don't have to do that. The way there could be something else. But in the end, we do know that somebody has to be the waiter and somebody has to work at McDonald's, Burger King, you call it. So it might be true that for one poison, uh, one person, it, uh, there are uh, ways to make it different, but all over, we know that our system needs those people doing these jobs. And an argument against, this, against the basic income, which is usually brought up is, yeah, but somebody has to do the bad work. Oh, uh, if the two comments about that one is from our experience, if a community needs something to be done, and even if it's, if it's a job that might be, well, let's say kind of disgusting or something like that, if it's vital for the community, it will be done. On the other hand, um, well, it's true for some jobs, which the community sees as unnecessary, it might not be done. So maybe cleaning jobs where people are cleaning other people's toilets won't be feasible in the future anymore because people have to start cleaning their own toilets in the worst case. But on the other hand, let's just think for one moment what that means. We are basically saying we know that we have to treat people like slaves to have our system running. And we know that almost everybody in the system has to be a slave in this definition, to have the system running. This doesn't really sound like freedom and peace to everybody to me. Uh, and therefore, it's um, not a, a vital uh, vision of the future, not what I would like to pursue. And yeah, the third part, which is more an eco ecological focused part, is the wastefulness we see in our production. Um, it's something that makes me think as an economist, because I always thought that our money-based system is, at least it is the most efficient you can ever imagine. And I was quite shocked when people showed me how wasteful we are with literally all resources we are using, starting with um, people and the time of people, which is, in my point of view, the most essential resource a person has. We see 
not just like uh, not, not just uh, since we we found out from David Gray, but that there are bullshit jobs. Uh, there are <laughs> there are many jobs uh, we do today which are not contributing to society at all. But um, even more so, we have millions of jobs which are billions of hours <laughs> a day spent just on thinking how to distribute and keep running our money system. Think about all the banks, all the insurances, think about uh, all of font and stock exchange based jobs and everything like that. They are all just, they're not taking care about how do we grow, in, how do we grow food? How do we build um, a machine? How do we improve it? No, you're just thinking about how to keep money flowing and how to make more of it, which is not um, the best contribution to society, at least I think. Um, and there, what, what, what struck me even more is the resource we use up for production. Think about without money, who in his right mind would ever come up with the idea to, product, uh, to produce um, goods which are designed to fail? after two or three years. Like, it's impossible to even think about that. It's totally insane. But even more so, also producing goods which are hard or impossible to repair. And we also started to create a way of producing goods which uh, made it impossible or very, very hard to recycle them. Because the resources are so cheap. But in the end, um, if we, like from the 70s started to produce goods which are at least easy to recycle, not even talking about if they had more endurance, but um, we would have used up most of the material, we could reuse most of the materials mined since the 70s, there would be no mining business today because everything would be just here reused all the time. And we see there that we have lots of waste uh, wastefulness in our resources going on because we produce for money and for making more money and expanding the money system and not because it fulfills people's needs. Um, and then there comes a point which struck me most, to be honest. I uh, realized that there is something like a dissonance between what we want and what we do. And as Maria stated earlier, we talked to many people all over the world and also you know area and all of the different age groups all of different educational groups all of different political backgrounds it all boiled down to see that they all want the same thing peace uh safety and supply for today and tomorrow for themselves and the family but after for everybody in the world so nobody wants other people to suffer and yet we do take actions every day, billions of people doing it, that make other people suffer. And it's not because they're bad people, that's <laughs> for sure for me. So how is it possible to, to think that everybody, at least almost everybody, is engaging in actions which destroy the planet and make other people suffer, make decisions like people getting evicted from their houses because they can't pay the rent. Uh, people letting let drown in the Caribbean, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, um, telling the Greek that they should save more money like after the financial crisis 2008 and have seeing uh, mothers giving away their children because they can't feed them anymore. It's all decisions made in our system and they are all very closely related to money. Not just talking about we are buying iPhones, well, we all know how they are produced at Foxconn in China. Um, we are having people tearing down, like on an everyday basis in Austria, um, tearing down trees and woods for building new streets and new houses and everything. Although the people doing it probably don't hate forests and probably don't really love streets being near <laughs> the forest. So. so it's not their intrinsical motivation. It's not there, it's not their bosses. And what we see is not only that in a, in a business, in a job context, we totally seem to forget what we do, uh, what we want, but also 
uh, what we are doing in the job context goes completely unchallenged from ourselves and from others. And it's an, a very, very, for, for me self, it was very eye-opening and shocking as well because I, I saw my, my own actions also reviewed in that kind. And it would be very interesting for me to see what you have, uh, what your thoughts about this would be later on. That being said, if you have more questions, you may find answers on our webpage. Uh, I can highly recommend the free book and just 25 pages read <laughs> of abolishing money from Eske Bockelmann. You can find it under the provided link. It is um, at least very thought provoking. So I would really encourage you to try what it does to your mind. And while well, the newest book of Eske Bockelmann which is more than just interesting. Unfortunately, it's only available in German right now because it's uh, quite recently published. But um, also here, if you have any questions, maybe we can help you later on. So thank you very much. And looking forward to our video. Yeah, thank you, Gerald, for your remarks. And I hope you as the audience got a bit of an overview on how we picture money. And as Gerald said, we now, we're now going to show you the video. Have fun. On January 2015, when some people gathered at the main square in Villach, a town in southern Austria, to raise their voice for the outbreak of world peace, nobody could have imagined what would emerge from this. There was one main consensus within the group. We want to meet the global challenges of our time on a local level. For this reason, we participated in the local election the same year. We based our campaign on peace and cooperation and we made it into the local council with one seat. We asked ourselves, what does Villach need right now so that a lasting societal transition can take root? As a first step, our free space, the Erde, emerged. Today, one could nearly call it a hotspot by Philax standards. In this place, we worked to develop numerous visionary ideas, and together we put them into practice. Step by step, the Erde became a lively place that contributed to the sharing of knowledge and experiences. Through workshops, lectures, and other events, people come together and share their views on various different topics, such as permaculture, climate protection, alternative housing, and many more. Everything one can see in our free space was received as a gift, from the couch to the oven, right through to the computer equipment. We didn't buy a single thing, not even the software that runs on it. Everything we do and everything we hand out to other people is a gift and not for sale. We practice a lively gift culture. To this end, we organize an online giving platform, a free box, as well as two old call boxes for people to share clothes, books and other things for everyday life. A diverse network of various people with numerous skills is growing. A community which seeks for resilience. Our relationships and bonds with each other are unconditional. We do not conditionally exchange, we only give. We take a stand for meeting the elementary needs of Philax people locally in a money-free and self-organized manner. That's why we suggested to turn Philax into an edible city in our first step. However, we didn't want to just talk. We needed to take action. In order to demonstrate how an edible city could look like, we built and planted the first raised beds in front of the Erde. Since then, a garden for all is flourishing. It is free to plant and pick for everyone. In the garden, we rely on diversity and cherish it. This is also reflected in our community. We constantly learn from and through each other. After an unanimous resolution passed by the local council to turn Villach into an edible city, we got the chance to design the first edible park in a public space. In Wirt Park, fruit trees and edible bushes are growing besides the cultivated vegetables in the raised beds. One can even find elements of permaculture, for example, the Benchias fence. 
With this in mind, we constantly engage ourselves to create a living environment that is more vivid and resilient than before, thus ensuring a more promising future for all people. But there is still a lot to do on this path and time continues to press. With proposals such as a self-managed basic supply chain, regional food sovereignty, free public transport, car-free city centers and regenerative soil management systems, we try to work on approaches as building blocks for a livable future. With our movement, we want to inspire people in our surroundings to become active and participate in or initiate their own local community-based project. Your action can change the world. So, hopefully you could get a bit of an overview about our movement and uh, Vanessa will now talk about how we organize it and which steps we take into a good life for all. Hello everyone. As Julia just introduced me, my name is Vanessa and I'm part of the movement Verantwortung Erde from one of the very first moments. So I'd like to give you some insights into our practical experiences we made over the last five years. And yeah, you've just seen a short movie about us, but of course it's not possible to demonstrate what we've been doing for five years in just a few minutes. So I'd like to add a few aspects on who we are and what we do. Actually, we like to call ourselves to be a movement because movement is what it needs now. We need movement. We need a shift towards a long lasting and sustainable societal transition to create a livable future for all beings. Second, the term movement describes us straight to the point because of our internal organization. So all people who call themselves to be part of Verantwortung Erde do whatever they want to and they do this voluntarily. So we neither have memberships nor do we have any kind of terms and conditions. We avoid hierarchical structures, so we do not have a boss or a chief who orders somebody to do something. And every small sub-project of the movement, be it building a free box or working out a political proposal, everything we do comes from within the group and is supported by others. Uh, we organize ourselves as well as our projects need-oriented. So we put our needs into practice. Another point which is quite important and I'm sure you're wondering about is how do we actually finance all this? And you've just seen our free space in the video, the free box, the gardens. All this becomes possible because we are represented in the local council with one mandate since 2015. At the very beginning, we had a lot of long and to be honest, really demanding discussions whether we should accept the promotion of democratic work in German, Förderung der demokratischen Arbeit, or not. After these discussions, we decided to take the money and transfer it from the current system to take the opportunity to realize projects and bring the Erde into being. And for me personally, taking the money and creating a place for the community was one of the most critical, but also one of the most important important decisions we ever had to make because considered retrospectively this was the step that made us concrete it made us reachable for others and it also made us strike roots in philax society what is even more important especially regarding the logic of money and our personal relations and bonds within the group is that we've never had existential fears at least so far. And due to this, we also never had the pressure or the compulsion to ask people for money and donations, neither within the group nor other people. So we also never had the issue of coming up with a model of collective or solidary financing, 
And honestly, I've never seen a box or a hat being passed from one to, the, to another. And this is really liberating. However, referring back to what Maria and Gerald explained before, realizing and understanding these concepts involves a lot of inner processes. And that's why I'd like to get a bit more personal now. I cannot speak for the whole group as I can only depict what I experienced myself. Though I'm sure that many people in my surrounding went through the same emotions and processes. But let's start. I assume that we all agree that money is the main reason why we destroy this beautiful planet. And I agree with Gerald that money is a means to exploit whole ecosystems as well as humans. And with humans, I mean people we don't even know because they live somewhere else on this planet, but we also exploit ourselves. And I've been observing this for a very long time. But what I couldn't see is that money, a little piece of paper with a number or just some number in a computer, simply seems to be necessary to live, but it is not. By meeting people who concern themselves a lot with this topic and who have become really good friends and fellows of mine, the scale really fell from my eyes. I realized that money is not a natural thing. It does not grow on trees. And there is also no natural law that we have to organize human life on earth through money and exchange. We can nourish, we can feed ourselves and lead a good life with vivid and trustful relationships without money. So I myself and some others made the all changing decision to lead the life free from the logic of money free from the logic of exchange, and in best case, free from money itself, which is an exciting journey, and it's something you do step by step. Yeah, I know the questions in your head because I'm already used to them. What do you live from? Well, I concluded that I have to quit my job because I don't want to sell myself anymore, and I don't want to sell my lifetime anymore. And I don't want to pay people to do any kind of things for me. And of course, at first, I fell in a big hole. Yeah. Luckily, I was not alone, but in company with my partner, Sasha. And we knew that we have to bring um, into being what we call money-free cycles. And logically, starting with our basic needs. And so, as a first step, one is constrained constrained to ask oneself, what do I really need? And thus, we started with food, growing food. You saw the gardens in the video, the garden Erde and the Wirt Park in the public space, but this of course was not enough to feed ourselves. So we went out searching for people who have space. And we found some who now provide us with space where we can grow our food on. At the moment, we farm fruits and vegetables in two gardens and one field in the surrounding of Villach. We follow the concept of community gardens and by the time our skills and experiences grow. But, <clears throat> excuse me, um, yeah, talking about gardening might be the best moment to explain what we mean with the term money free cycles. So um, let's take beans <laughs> as a concrete example. Usually one goes to some kind of market and buys beans with money. If you like to develop a money-free bean cycle, you might come up with the idea of growing beans on your own. So you need one space to grow them, you need seeds, you need time and you need skills to do this. So the space we already had, as mentioned before. Our next step was organizing seed giving or seed swapping events where a lot of people get a diversity of seeds for free. In the following, you grow the beans, harvest them to eat and select some of them 
for growing beans the next year as well. I personally have the time I need for growing my own beans because I'm always reducing the amount of money I need and therefore I need to spend less time in the job. The necessary skills I get from social relationships as I'm part of a community and I'm invited to learn from other people's experiences. Additionally, to close this money-free cycle, we don't sell the beans, but we eat them. But we could even go one step further here. After the last yield, we put the plants on the compost to harvest soil for the next gardening season, which is the next money-free cycle, producing soil. One can adopt this kind of procedure for nearly everything. It might be more complicated with organizing other things, but step by step, more and more of these cycles like these develop. And if you, if you escape from the logic of money. And as our community is growing, the possibility to meet our needs by some money-free cycles is gradually, gradually growing as well. Um, I'd like to add a little anecdote from the garden in order to refer to one of the dysfunctions um, of money that Gerald mentioned before, namely the production for a market and the production for supply. The first year we had, uh, we were gardening, we had a really great amount of potatoes because we um, were given potatoes, seed potatoes and we had little variety of other vegetables. But the potatoes were full with potato bugs and so we had to collect these bugs and we got really close to the plants. Uh, we took a lot of care of them and then the day of the yield came and we found numerous potatoes with wireworms. A really important observation for me personally was that if you produce for supply, you simply cut off the part of the potato with the wire worm and you cook and use the rest of it. If we think of production for a money-based market, we would have had to throw away half of our yield because no one would buy such potatoes. But we produce them for our supply and not in order to sell them. Uh, besides, we do not only produce food, we also experiment with numerous other natural resources in order to cover our needs. Uh, for example, we use the horse chestnut in order to wash our clothes and we use other wild plants and they're used for food or medicinal products such as salves and tinctures and so on. But yeah, what else do we need? Of course, we need a lot of materials and goods, such as clothes, tools, furniture. And you've already seen the free box in front of our free space in the video. And honestly, this little box opens space to establish a gift culture, as well as a sharing culture within the whole community, and also way beyond that. It somehow follows the permaculture principle, make use of what is already here, and the only challenge is that the things need to find the right place. So if we need something, we always find a way how to get it. Sometimes, and this is really interesting, the things come as soon as we're aware of its need. And well, I could talk for hours about gift culture and the way one can get to resources through different platforms and social bonds, but I would like to share three main aspects for a culture of giving in order to flourish. So first, I think we have to learn to clearly announce what we need. This sounds so simple, but in my experience, people very often hesitate to tell what they need. Second, we have to learn to be given things for free. If there is one thing I can tell you, and I'm observing the gift box for more than four years now, giving is much easier than to be given. Because if you're the one who has been given, you think you owe the other something. And this is not true. There is no debt from the moment you escape from the logic of money. And giving unconditionally is a long path and a strong process 
we have to learn this because we are simply not used to it. And three, another big challenge, we must be able to part with our things. People tend to accumulate things and resources, although they don't even need them. So let's start sharing and let our things fulfill their purpose instead of gathering dust in some cellars. However, of course, we do not only need material things because at some point we might also need services. And here I'd like to give you an example. Uh, actually, I don't need hairstyles because I simply don't care. But one day I had the feeling my hair needs some dressing. So I asked a friend of mine who gave me haircut. And it was really nice because it, maybe it wasn't the best style I ever had. But what I felt was that somebody who I'm connected with did something for me unconditionally. And here also the importance of community comes in because the more people you know and tell from your personal path, the more possibilities you have. And finally, also a question that always arises, how do you organize your home? Where do you live? And I need to, to tell you that I, as well as my partner, Sasha, we are the luckiest people on earth because when we concerned ourselves more and more with the challenge to lead a life free from the logic of money, we were invited to live in community without paying rent by the lovely Kamvania family. And this family is also a crucial part of the project and they also focus on building these money-free cycles. So we are six people living in a household and we are always keen on cutting down our fixed costs so we can gradually dismiss money from our daily lives. And therefore, we both have the opportunity to spend all our time and energies on solutionary approaches for a future life, free of fears, free of competition and destruction, but based on social bonds and connectedness with all life. And in front of the house we live in, there's a tiny house, which Maria built in order to put her ideas of money-free housing into practice. You might get an insight into her project later on. But yeah, to bring all these thoughts to an end, step by step, we cut down consumption and focus on building cycles that provide us with all we need without money. And the less we consume, and the less we make use of money, the more we practice degrowth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for these really personal insights. And uh, it's always so nice to listen what, how you perceive the world is great. Yeah. Thank you. 